So diabetes mellitus is a metabolic disorder characterized by hyperglycemia. And you can get this hyperglycemia either due to deficiency of insulin, this is a type 1 diabetes mellitus, or your end organs are resistant to insulin. So you do make insulin, but it doesn't work. Your, your cells in the rest of your body don't respond to it. That's type 2 diabetes mellitus. I'm sure you've heard all about type 1, type 2, and that's what it is. Type 1, because you're lacking insulin, you're not making insulin. Type 2 is insulin resistance. How do we get this? So type 1 diabetes mellitus is uh, it's due to autoimmune antibody destruction of the beta cells of the pancreas and this manifests in childhood. It's associated with this these two uh, HLA-DR3 and HLA-DR4. Again, it manifests childhood diabetes, more than, most likely type 1 diabetes mellitus. Though more, more recently we're, getting, we're seeing more and more type 2 diabetes, I'm going to tell you why in children. Type 2 diabetes is you get insulin resistance in peripheral tissues and eventually you're going to get decreased pancreatic insulin secretion. So the insulin resistance arises due to obesity and lack of physical activity. Sorry for my writing. Decreased physical activity. And why and this is why I'm telling you that now we're seeing more and more children with type 2 diabetes mellitus. That's because we're seeing more and more obese children decrease physical activity. And what happens with this insulin resistance is, well, you, you're, you're basically going to have more and more blood sugar, right? You're going to have hyperglycemia, and that's going to tell you your pancreas is going to want to make more and more insulin. So you're going to make pro-insulin, and you're going to make pro amylin together they're going to be made in the pancreas and you're going to get amyloid depos deposition in the pancreas and this amyloid deposition is going to impair insulin secretion from the pancreas so first you get insulin resistance and eventually you're going to develop defective insulin secretion okay so first you get insulin then you get decreased insulin secretion as well so clinical features of diabetes mellitus Remember what I told you about what diabetes means? Remember diabetes means you're like peeing too much? And mellitus means it's like sweet. It's kind of like sweet urine basically. We're talking about that. So that tells you your symptoms. You're peeing too much and you have sweet urine. You have glucose in your urine. That's because you have too much glucose in your blood. And eventually you're going to overwhelm. Remember we talked about this. We're going to overwhelm the, the kidney's ability to reabsorb glucose. And now you're going to have glucose appearing in your urine. If, you're, if you don't have diabetes, you do not have glucose in your urine because you reabsorb it all, even if you're eating ice cream every day, okay? But if you have diabetes, you're going to get glucose in your urine. You're going to get you're going to be peeing too much. Because you're peeing too much, you're going to have excessive thirst. Other thing you're going to see in these patients, you're going to see weight loss and polyphagia. Because, first of all, insulin, when we said it's anabolic, it helps you build stuff up. But you're not, you're not getting insulin. You're not, getting built, you're not building up muscle. You're not building up fat. So you're getting weight loss. You're also going to get unopposed uh, glucagon. Same thing. You're breaking stuff down. So you get weight loss and you get polyphagia. You're going to be very hungry. And that's the sad thing. You're going to feel star You feel like you're starving. It's like they call it starving in the face of plenty or something. Because you have all this glucose in your blood, but you can't use it. Okay, and you just start. You just need all the energy. There's so much energy in your blood, but it's not getting taken up by your cells. So, glucosuria, polyuria, weight loss, polyphagia, and then type one diabetes is associated with the diabetic ketoacidosis. Type two is associated with hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state. We're going to talk about both of these in a second. How do we diagnose this? We use lab values. There's a couple numbers that you're going to have to memorize. Um, this is high yield because you're gonna diabetes is just so common, so it's just worth memorizing anyway. So first is HbA1c hemoglobin A1c levels six, greater than six point five is diagnostic of diabetes mellitus. And what this tells you is this is it corresponds to your average blood glucose over the over two to three months. Okay. Fasting. If you have a fasting plasma glucose of over 126, if your glucose levels are over 126, if you haven't eaten over eight hours, that's diagnostic of, of diabetes. Or if your glucose levels are greater than 200 after a glucose load, two hours after a glucose load, that is also diagnostic. Again, you do have to check these multiple times to make sure it's not a fluke, but these are the numbers. 200 after glucose load, 126 fasting, A1C greater than or the same as 6.5%. 
Okay, that's how you that any of these can diagnose diabetes mellitus. Now, complications of diet. We talked about symptoms, but there's a lot of complications. These are the these are like the real problem with diabetes. All the complications that can occur. So the complications occur. There's two there's two methods. But first of all, they're gonna cause problems in the kidney, in the retina, in the peripheral nerves, and the blood vessels. You might have heard of these. You might have heard of diabetic nephropathy. That's in the kidney. Problems in the kidney. Diabetic retinopathy. Problems in the retina. Diabetic neuropathy. That's problems of the, of the nerves. Okay. And again, I told you there's two types of damage that can cause these. First is non-enzymatic glycosylation. So basically, you get cross-linking of collagen with proteins, and you get thickening of blood vessel walls. What happens is you have all this glucose in your in your blood. Your glucose gets attached to proteins. That's called glycosylation. And now your protein with glucose it will accumulate and it's going to cross-link with, with collagen. And you can get thick, and this is going to happen in the vascular basement membranes and you can get thickening. Now this can happen in both large and small vessels. Cross-linking in large vessels causes atherosclerosis. So you get atherosclerosis of coronary arteries and you get coronary artery disease. So that's around the heart, the vessels of the heart. And you can also get it in the peripheral vessels. You get peripheral vascular disease. Again, you get thickening due to this cross-linking. You have decreased blood flow decrease blood flow to the heart, decrease blood flow to the peripheral tissue, and you get a lot of problems. Remember, we talked about heart disease, we talked about diabetes was the main, one of the main risk factors for, for coronary artery disease, smoking, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, okay? You just have to keep, those are like the same thing over and over again. Now, if you get non-enzymatic glycosylation of small vessels, you cause a hyaline arteriosclerosis. So small vessels like arterials get hyaline arterial sclerosis, but same thing, you basically get thickening of these small vessels. So small vessels like renal arterials, you get nephrotic syndrome we talked about. And do you remember, what was that characteristic, uh, very characteristic biopsy feature in diabetic nephrotic syndrome? Remember, you get that chemistial Wilson nodule. If you see those nodules, you know it's diabetic nephropic syndrome, nephrotic syndrome. And then also retinal small vessels, you get a retinopathy, okay? So that's how you get heart disease and vessel disease, you get kidney disease, you get retinal disease. The other way, so this is all from glycosylation with glucose attaching to proteins, cross-linking to collagen and thickening of the basement membranes. Now, if the other thing you can do is you get osmotic damage. What happens here? Osmotic damage is because there's some cells that can take in glucose without insulin. I told you, diabetes is because you're, you don't have insulin, so your cells aren't taking it up, so you have all this glucose in your blood. But there's a few cells in the body that don't need insulin to take up glucose. And specifically, that's the lens of the eye and the peripheral nerves. So what's going to happen? There's, you have so much glucose in the blood, so they're going to take up a lot of glucose. You have excessive levels of intracellular glucose. And then glucose is going to be converted to sorbitol and fructose. So what happens to osmotic pressure? So you have all this glucose, 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 glucose. What happens to your osmotic pressure? Osmotic pressure is going to be very increased. So where is water going to go? Remember, water always goes from low to high osmotic pressure. And now you have all this water. You're going to get ballooning of the cell. And then the cell is going to rupture. Okay, You get osmotic rupture and that leads to damage. So I told you where, where, which cells in the body? Cells in the lens and the peripheral nerves. So you can get lens rupture, uh, cells, osmotic rupture in the lens leads to cataracts. Osmotic rupture in the peripheral nerves contributes to neuropathy. Okay, And then neuropathy, what symptoms would you get? So it's just all the... It's everything, autonomic symptoms, motor symptoms, sensory symptoms. And then the key thing is it's in, it's in a stocking and glove distri distribution. Okay, the reason why you get those, okay, stocking and glove distribution. Okay, now I'm going to lengthen this lecture a little bit and just talk about these complications because I see these so much. And these complications can really, really impact a patient's quality of life. I was seeing a patient, he... First of all, he couldn't see. He had retinopathy. He was freaking blind. He had, um, he had the he had freaking kidney failure from the nephrotic syndrome. He had diabetic neuropathy. That that's the one you see the most, like very very often. He had diabetic neuropathy. So he he had poor um, poor sensory problems. He had poor balance. He could barely stand on his own. Anyways, he was a mess, and that's all just because of this chronic. High blood, high blood glucose messing up all these parts of your body. So this is no fun, okay? All right, so the way we treat this is we the treatment differs by type 1 versus type 2. If you're type 1, what's the whole problem in type 1? Type 1 is because you're not making insulin. 
Well, fortunately, now we have synthetic insulin. We, I mean, we can make our own. We can make insulin and give it to people. So in type one, you just give them insulin. Type one is insulin dependent, so you treat them with lifelong insulin replacement. Type two is non-insulin dependent, right? Because the body still makes insulin. What's the whole problem in type two? Remember, it's insulin resistance. So we try to counter that insulin resistance, and first of all, we try to counter it with weight loss. And we also remember weight loss was the whole pro reason why weight loss and lack of physical activity leads to insulin resistance. So you do that, and you also have drugs that improve insulin sensitivity, specifically stuff like metformin, sulfonylureas, okay. And so when we get, that's that's what we start off with, okay. However, I told you that eventually you're going to get defective insulin secretion. So it's going to kind of look kind of like type one. You're going to be insulin. You're not making any insulin at all. So now you're going to you might need to replace insulin. You might need to start insulin replacement. So that's it for our diabetes mellitus. This is super high yield for step one and for, for real life. Make sure you know all of this. And we're going to go into the complications of hyperglycemic crisis. So this is problems, acute crises from hyperglycemia. There's two of them we want to know about. I already mentioned them. Remember, what do we say? What do we say was, the, was associated with type 1 diabetes mellitus? And we said it was diabetic ketoacidosis. Okay. And this is, you get hyperglycemia and it leads to a metabolic acidosis with too many keto acids. You can tell from the name, ketoacidosis. And the whole reason why is because there's lack of insulin to suppress lipolysis. Okay. Because if you get lipolysis, you get lipolysis. Let me write this down. You get free fatty acids. And then free fatty acids are going to be converted into ketone bodies, which are basically keto acids. So now you're going to get too much you're going to get too much lipolysis, you can get too much ketone body, it's keto acids. Now you have, you're producing all these extra acids, so that's why you get a metabolic acidosis. We're in diabetic ketoacidosis, this is an increased ion gap ketoacidosis. And this is what's going to cause symptoms. You're going to have increased blood sugar and increased keto acids. That's going to cause your symptoms. And I want to point out, it's, it's only, it usually only happens in type 1 diabetes, because the whole problem is because of the lack of insulin. In type 2, we said it was hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state, where the problem is simply just from too much glucose in the blood. Okay, It's just that they, they're not taking any medication, so their blood glucose, glucose keeps going up and up. And the problem is, the, the, I want to add that there's no ketoacidosis here. Why is there no ketoacidosis here? Because these patients still have a little bit of insulin, and even though they have insulin resistance, there is still some insulin working. So there's still some insulin working. When insulin, what do we say, builds stuff, right? It's anabolic. So instead of breaking down fat, we don't break down fat. We build up fat. So you don't, you don't get lipolysis. You don't get ketone body production. Okay. So the only problem here is from too much glucose in the blood. So let's go back. Let's focus on diabetic ketoacidosis now. Symptoms here is nice mnemonic is just DKA. So diabetic ketoacidosis stands for DKA. You get delirium. You get cosmo respirations. Cosmo respirations are rapid, rapid, deep labored breathing. Finally, you get abdominal pain. You get some other GI symptoms, nausea and vomiting. So DKA, delirium, cosmo respirations, abdominal pain. The other thing you see is you get fruity breath, fruity breath from from uh, you're breathing out all these ketones, all these uh, ketones, and the keto keto acids is the problem. Okay, you're breathing out all these ketones. You get a fruity smelling breath, and I told you you get an anion gap metabolic acidosis from production of all these keto acids so acids in your blood cause acidosis and you get a hyperkalemia in the blood but a decreased total body potassium so this hyperkalemia is high potassium levels in the blood but your total level body total body levels of, of potassium is decreased now why would you have total decreased body potassium what is what is one symptom that we see in um, diabetic ketoacidosis, which I didn't tell you about, but from too much glucose, you get you get polyuria, you're peeing all, all of it, because all this glucose is, acts as an osmotic diuretic, okay? You're peeing all, a bunch of stuff, and you're going to pee out a lot of K+. Now, why would you have hyperkalemia, though, if you have low body potassium? Why? Well, what, what did insulin do to potassium? Do you remember? Remember, insulin makes potassium go in, but if we don't have insulin... So you have all your potassium out here in the blood vessels instead. So now you have high high levels of potassium in the blood and low levels of potassium in the cells. 
Okay, so the way we treat this is pretty simple. What are we going to do? What are our problems here? Our problems are too much blood glucose. We have dehydration because they're peeing everything out. And then they have decreased levels of potassium. So you give them fluids, you give them insulin for the glucose, and you give them potassium. Now you need to give glucose as needed. So what? It's like uh, as needed to prevent hypoglycemia from the insulin treatment. So like that doesn't make sense at first because the whole problem is too much glucose. But you're going to give them insulin and you're going to keep giving them insulin even when the blood glucose has normalized because remember we told you the insulin makes potassium go in. You want you want to restore intracellular levels of potassium. So you keep giving insulin. So eventually you're going to risk lowering your blood glucose too much. So you can also give glucose as needed to replenish that. So fluids, insulin, potassium are the mainstays. Now, when we go to hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state, what symptoms would you expect here? If you have just the symptoms, I told you the whole problem is too much blood glucose. What symptoms would you expect? You expect severe diuresis. I told you, you, just, you have polyuria. You have um, just glucose urea. You're going to get dehydration eventually and hypotension. So, and then this stuff is going to lead to symptoms like altered mental status, coma, and eventually death. So how do we treat this? Pretty much the same as above, but so you have dehydration and you have too much glucose. So in this, it's over 500 milligrams per deciliter. Remember, remember, remember what, what do we actually? Let's just uh, off sidetrack right now. How do we diagnose glucose uh, diabetes? Just for reference, remember fasting. What was the fasting level that needs to be? It needs to be greater than or the same as 126. What was the um, the glucose load one after two hours? It needs to be greater than or the same as 200. In these guys, you have over 500 milligrams per deciliter. Okay, so treatment, treatment is fluids and insulin. Fluids for the dehydration, insulin to lower blood glucose. So that's it for diabetes and for hyperglycemic crises.